Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. The Collaborator of Leaders Huddle. Excited to have you with us. Fired up this morning, this afternoon for some of you. We've got folks from Belgium, Singapore, uh, our friends to the north in Canada and other countries. Uh, the, the, the crowd continues to grow. Thank you for joining us. Uh, excited about what we're going to be accomplishing. Of course, the Collaborative Leaders Huddle is sponsored by Veris Global. Veris Global, where we, of course, believe that organizations that are not aligned fail customers and employees. And so, for, therefore, at Veris Global, we quickly align teams, their critical imperatives, so they can consistently succeed. One of those organizations that we're proud to serve uh, has a leadership, a member of their leadership team joining us today. Excited about that. But first, I want to introduce my co-host, Kyle Shelley. Kyle Shelley does remarkable work for us at Veris Global. Uh, Kyle, say hello in a few words in terms of requests of our, our participants this morning. Good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, hopefully the prerequisite of having a massive amount of coffee you all have. Um, as we have our great time today with Michael, if you have any questions in the chats, go ahead and fire your questions. And if you could truncate them, um, as concise as possible. We're gonna to try to get to as many of those as we possibly can. Um, I'll either speak them for you. If you want it to be private, let me know, or I'll call on you and ask you to ask the question yourself. So that's a little bit of the housekeeping stuff. So I'll turn that back to Craig now. It's not often you get to start a huddle like this with a product promo. It's not really a product promo. I'm just saying thank you to this gentleman who leads this fine organization. I've got my DT1 in so I can actually see our network here, and I thank you uh, for that, uh, Michael Onscheck. Michael Onscheck, President of Global Business and Innovation. You can see there on the screen in front of you his role, his work. Elcon helps the world, ensures the world actually can see brilliantly. Uh, leading eye care provider, uh, and, and it's more than that. Uh, you're talking about an organization that if you've been following the news uh, just a little bit over a year ago, spun off from Novartis, and uh, as an $8 billion company, that's not an easy chore. And one of the things that was critical for Elcon in their early success and now sustained success is that they maintain that legacy of incredible innovation. Uh, and it's more than just innovating, you know, bringing new products so those of us in the world can see brilliantly. It's, it's innovating today in, in terms of how we even do business. And so we have a rare opportunity to connect with an individual that truly gets how to how to align teams cross-functionally. Um, and what's special about this is Michael Onischuk, you know, in, in talking with several of his peers, associates at Alcon, one person actually described Michael as a unicorn. Now my seven-year-old, that confuses them, uh, but a unicorn, of course, the rest of us know that that's, that means something special. It means hard to find, a rarity. And you ask this person, you know, why do you call him a unicorn? And it's because Michael has so many qualities, traits, not just outstanding leaders, but this is what I would add. Michael's an outstanding human being. And, and he, he reaffirms my belief that if you wanna be an exceptional leader, it begins with being an exceptional person. And so it is, it is truly a pleasure and an honor to welcome you, Michael Onischek, to the connector, excuse me, the Collaborative Leaders Huddle. Welcome. Well, yeah, Craig, first, thank you for uh, inviting me, uh, Kyle. It's, it's gonna be fun to do this with you guys. Um, you're, you've probably oversold the whole thing, Craig, as, as normal, but uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with the folks who are on the call, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much for having me in. Yeah, you got it. Very sincere words. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and true to the Collaborative Leaders Huddle, we're going to jump right in. Our question, our big question of our time together today of our huddle uh, is, how do you, how do you align cross-functional teams? Uh, Michael, before the call came in, before we had invited the network into our huddle here, we were talking about the fact that you obviously foot, have a footprint around the world, so you got teams that you're working with, and you know, obviously several continents. What's what's your advice for us? How do we how do we all do it even better? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because in the middle of this crisis, uh, we've gotten more closely aligned. I mean, people are easy. It's easier to connect now. For me personally to units that are around the world because we we just now do it this way i don't have to get on an airplane they don't have to get on an airplane we can just pick up the phone we can get on a virtual call and we can start to have conversations that you know frankly used to take us hours to get there and i think the the whole 
the whole way to build collaboration is actually that human connection and using technology like this is now helping us do that better than ever. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, one of the things that I'd follow up with, and as those of you who are listening again, reminders, start sending your questions for Michael to, to Kyle. But my follow-up question for you, Michael, one of the things that I'm hearing from the field, in fact, I saw some data on this, uh, that in the United States, we're working three hours longer than we were before the crisis. Three hours more, as if we all had three additional three hours. Uh, in Europe, it's two hours longer. Um, and one of the reasons that they're saying is because organizations are quote unquote over communicating. But what they're also finding is that we're communicating in verticals for those to whom we are responsible for leading. Yet you know more than more than most, hey, we got to communicate this way. And so what are you doing yeah. at Elcon to ensure the communication, effective communication required for collaboration cross functionally? What are some of the things that you're doing? Yes, well, look, we've, we've started to do some video conferencing with the entire organization. I mean, there was a Cinco de Mayo, uh, you know, little uh, drink session on Tuesday. And, you know, it, it really has flattened the organization for us. And so everybody's now getting on the calls. We're having conversations that are much closer to the teams and the pipelines. Uh, and their activity is right there. I and mean, we have the opportunity now to spend more time with them, talking about what's important to them, where they're struggling, what challenges they're having. Um, I've done a few videos that speak to the fact that there's pressure on the teams that are our pipeline teams that are delivering technology. There's pressure because they can't be together. And it's how can we overcome that? How can we as leaders because we've all aligned to an imperative, how can we show up and make sure that we're still leading in an environment that's very different than what most people have seen and, and felt before? And so, you know, I, I'm actually feeling more connected. I think our organization is feeling more connected because we have gone across the organization and we're doing cross-functional calls as opposed to you know, me always working with the same level of executive in every meeting that I'm having. We're having much more diverse calls than we have in the past. And I think that that's generating a positive energy for the organization. I just want to make sure, Kyle, before I come to you, uh, Mike, I want to make sure then, is it okay? Would you agree? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're being purposeful in that and being intentional in some of those connections, being even relational building. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and what we're we're finding is, you know, we're being much more human. I mean, it, it, it's we're watching people in an environment that is their home. Or, I mean, some people are really struggling in some of our Asian countries. They don't have a place to go, and so the office was the only place that they could work. Their homes are so small that they're really feeling isolated because they're not in their normal working environment. Well, that's really impactful when you, when you can be connected to individuals and see how they have to live or how they have to work with their working conditions have changed. Um, it, it just humanizes that connection that we didn't have before. And I think that that's really important in linking and collaboration as well. It's, it's, it's redefining how we think about the, the folks that we work with every day. I'm fascinated by that. Kyle, as I come over to you, I'm gonna share a lot of the experts out there. They talk about trust. What are the components of trust? We all know that we've gotta we've got to be credible. We've gotta be consistent. But what the, the researchers are finding is there needs to be also an affinity among each other and then, and then a, a, a selflessness. And I'm with you, Michael, that, that getting to see people in their, in their homes uh, it, it's a, there's, there's more personal, uh, which allows us to connect even more uh, in terms of that affinity. Uh, Kyle, do we have questions coming in and or do you have a question for Michael yourself? Um, yeah, I do. I actually have one that um, kind of mixes a couple questions and it's surrounding alignment. And um, then I'm also going to ask Brian to share his real quick because I think they go kind of hand in hand. So uh, Brian Anderson, if you would, Unmute yourself and if you want to ask that to Michael and then I'll just preface what his question is going to be. How do we also tie that into aligning objectives, which is a question from Stephen. 
So Brian, why don't you go ahead and ask yours? Sure, thanks Kyle. Hey, good morning everybody. My name is Brian Anderson, um, first time at the huddle, so um, it's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, one thing that I've, I've been exposed to was sometimes when um, senior leaders have the opportunity to get so close to teams or closer than they normally do, um, there's a pressure to overmanage or micromanage that team and the deliverables of it. What are some ways that, that you um, have seen be successful to avoid that behavior? Yeah, uh, look, it, it, it's a it's a real risk when you let executives into into core teams and into the processes that they're working. Right, uh, Brian, I, I think the, the reality is we start with the imperative and, and we recognize yeah, I personally recognize that the core teams or the pipeline teams are much more intimately engaged and they're much more well prepared to deal with the day to day activities. And so, you know, our our role as leaders is to align around the strategic objectives make sure that everyone in the organization across all the functions are aligned to those same objectives so the stakeholders all have the same kind of goal and then it's really for us to step back and let the teams roll forward and monitor the metrics or the kpis in terms of how are the programs progressing then the other thing that I, I think is super important is to ask the question, what hurdles are they facing and how can we help them overcome those hurdles? What are the barriers that they're encountering? Are they financial? Are they timeline pressures? Are they access to resources? And, and ask where you can contribute as opposed to um, constantly monitoring and deeping, deep diving. And, and so, you know, you have to be humble as a leader. You have to let the team know that they, they're in control and that you honestly trust them. And by turning that trust over to them and just monitoring the KPIs as to how the program is going, I think it's a real, uh, it's a real opportunity for the teams then to take ownership of the program themselves. That's great, thanks. Brian, thank you for yeah, that question. Thanks, and uh, uh, one of the things that um, that's funny is you're asking that question. I was looking at, I got a couple of teammates. I was looking at their eyes and they're like, yeah, let's see what Craig says about that one. Because <laughs> <laughs> micromanagement is a big deal, isn't it? Well, one of the things that uh, I gained from another leader actually, and, and just mimicking them and building on Michael's thought is with, with this shift, and a lot of us are having to shift uh, how we're doing business. And therefore, even some at Veris Global, some of our KPIs are changing, they're evolving. Uh, and one of the things that we're finding useful is to be really clear on why we're asking the questions. Um, and because we're 100% virtual now, all of us, uh, without having that line of sight, perhaps like we used to, um, being really clear around why we're asking questions, um, the, the intent behind that. Uh, because I'm with you, Brian. Uh, I don't think anybody in this huddle wants to be seen or it's, be seen or perceived as a, as a micromanager. So really appreciate that question. Kyle, let's come back to you, additional questions. Yeah, I have one for Michael. I think when people, they actually come together and they're now virtual, um, it, it frames the individual, right? And some people are not used to doing virtual. And I think when you are framed and the spotlight is on you, it, it's hard to be truly authentic. It's hard to really put yourself out there because you don't have the nonverbals of actually feeling how everyone uh, it is taking what you're suggesting as a leader, knowing that this time is extremely important to be able to move quickly and to realign on a, a, your imperatives. How do you think you build trust in the virtual world? What would be the, the best way that you would suggest to do that? And then what I think hindrances have you seen with teams right now trying to adjust? Yeah, no, I look. I find this, it's very difficult for me. You know, one of the things that I've always relied on in, you know, in working with teams is that, that interconnection and that personal bond that you get by, you know, just the, the greeting, the opportunity to walk in the room, you know, the, the chance to make a, uh, you know, a joke or, or, you know, start the conversation off in a very different way, you know, 
I think what's the best way to do that is to act very naturally in this in this environment. I, I mean, we were, we started in this huddle and there were just the three of us, and now we've got an entire screen full of people. And all of a sudden, when that happened, it was kind of like, whoa, wait, wait, where's Craig? I gotta find Craig. I gotta find Kyle. Who am I talking to here? Well, now I get to talk to all of these folks. And so, you know, I think what it is is it's. It's being yourself. It's, it's being relaxed around the the situation. It is recognizing that um, this is a different way for us to do everything. And I also think that you have to realize that people are giving us more flexibility and freedom, right? They realize that this is an unnatural place. And because it's unnatural, it's unnatural for you. It's unnatural for them. It's okay. And so I think we just have to relax a little bit and, and enjoy it. I've seen some really great behavior out of uh, our organization as, they, as they're starting uh, doing all this stuff for the first time. And, and I, think it's, I, I think it's becoming much more natural. We went from not knowing how to do this to now getting okay with it. Now I think people are really becoming quite, quite confident in doing the virtual um, connection. I would submit that that's as collaborative leaders, that's our responsibility. That's not just something that we should allow to, or kind of wait for it to happen through practice. Michael, what you're saying is so essential and it's a responsibility of collaborative leaders to make it happen, whether it's through practice or simply modeling being ourselves uh, in, in, in front of these cameras and these virtual meetings. Uh, I, I support what you're saying. Kyle? Yeah, I wanna, Ask Kevin, um, I may put your last name. So in advance, my apologies, Kevin uh, Garo, I believe if you could ask your question uh, to Michael, because I think that's right in line with what we're Drew. discussing. Yes. So Kevin, if you can unmute yourself, ask us your question. Can you guys hear me now? Yep, we can, Kevin. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so my question was, uh, in Craig is, is intimately familiar with what's going on uh, within our organization. We've got a significant amount of change that has happened in the last couple of months. Um, layer on top of that, all this remote, uh, you know, uh, networking, communication, learning, uh, meetings. Um, but our general community within our company hasn't felt that the communication from the top down has met their expectations. Um, so I'm two parts kind of the first one and the question I put in the in the chat was you know what kind of strategies would you recommend uh, to someone like me who is a leader within the organization who tries to interface to you know my direct reports and, and the vast majority of our community to try to you know uh, put their minds at ease you know with all of this change that's happening um, but how, how should I interact up the ways uh, you know with my senior leadership to try to um, you know, not shame them, but kind of let them know that I don't feel that they're doing an effective job, um, you know, communicating, uh, you know, the change that is happening, um, you know, and, and I, I almost feel like sometimes they're using the excuse of the remote, you know, or the remote, you know, interaction as an excuse not to have to do some of that stuff, right, that they'd rather do that stuff in person, which yeah. is a more traditional way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kevin, I don't, I don't know the exact situation that you guys are in, but, you know, we've gone through significant change in our organization as well. And, and we at the senior leadership level, actually across the entire organization said, look, communication is a priority. Now, um, we are using feedback loops. We, we do a regular survey of our associates and, and we use that as a tool to guide us as a leadership team in terms of what we need to do. I would tell you if, you, if you're confident, you should be speaking to the most senior leaders saying the organization needs to hear from you. They need to, they need you to demonstrate that you're connected to them and you understand the situation that they're going through. I think if you can, if, if you have the courage to go through that, I would say do it because that is, that'll demonstrate a level of leadership that, um, that I think most us executives would appreciate. We need to understand, we need to hear from the community that we serve. Um, and and I, I say that that way. I think at our company, we, we've decided that we're going to run our company as an inverted pyramid where those who are closest to the customer are the most important. And the executive team, which is furthest away from the customer and our associates are our customers, 
they are more important than we are. And so if you, if you can maybe frame it up with your executives that there's a real need to hear from them right now, um, I think they would appreciate it. Then the second part of that is the content. How does the content get built and delivered? And, you know, just a week ago, I heard from some of our associates that they were worried that their pipeline projects were or might slip and that they would be judged against that slippage. Um, I did a five minute video from my office in our home and I recorded it. I set it out on, um, you know, we transfer to the to our our comms team and they posted it right and so it's not that hard to do i mean even a, a you know a technically challenged executive can pull this off so i think you just may or you may want to do a video and send it out to your team so i think now is the time to be more communicating than less communicating and i think you just need to share that that concern with your executive team and you too can take the initiative yourself, show them how to do it. I mean, it's uh, it, it, it's there for you. Awesome, I you know, that. Kevin, I wanna, I wanna thank you because one of the reasons why these huddles have become so popular is because they are raw. It's unfiltered, unscripted, this is yeah. live and yeah. uh, it's real. And so uh, that's a real issue for, for a lot of organizations uh, and, and something that we're consciously aware of. The one point I would add, is, uh, and I know everybody in this network knows this, communication becomes communication when, when, we, when, we, when we affect how it's being experienced. And so we can throw data, we can throw information, we can throw updates, um, and, and at the end of the day, it's how are our teams experiencing and internalizing the information they're receiving. And, that, and we all know one of the most powerful ways of doing that is to ask, what does this information mean to you? What does the data that we have mean to us and our actions? Uh, what's the experience we are having and the experience we need to have? And so communication, of course, we all know it's two-way. Um, and so Kevin, in addition to what Michael's sharing around speaking upward or communicating upward and asking for more, with what we get, I encourage us as collaborative leaders to make sure that the experience of that data, that information is also uh, is, 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 is effectively utilized you will. Yeah. Hey, and Craig, on top of that, right, as, as, I, as I prepare to communicate to the organization, I share what I am going to communicate to people who I think have a pulse on the organization, right? They, they're well connected to the organization. So I'll send what I'm going to say to a couple of folks and I'll ask them to give me feedback, like, will this resonate or will this land the wrong way? And many times I get really good input, like you should just tweak this or you, you need to be a little bit more conscious of this part of the organization feels like they're being left out. Bring them into the conversation, make sure that they realize that they're, they're they too are being recognized. So I would, I would just suggest that as you go out to communicate, find people who are the connectors in your organization and ask them to help you with the messaging that you're going to be delivering. Yeah. If I could add to that, um, one thing, and I know you personally, Michael, and it's interesting, there's, when you have authenticity and you do that very well, um, meeting you for the first time or the third time, um, being very open and transparent, I think in creating that trust with the individuals, you mentioned something just now, um, and I'm going to come to you, Bruce Denecker, with your question, but you talked about the videos that you shot, just a quick five minute video that to me seems like that would be helpful instead of the hierarchy being up here and we put off, you know, when there's a tragedy or when there's something, it's like, here's the memo, but it's a, it's a video instead of just a conversational piece that actually shows who you are as a human being and acknowledging yeah. where, where they are at, where the organization is and where we ultimately want to go. Can you speak to the, the importance of having that authenticity and that, that reach, if you will? Yeah, you know, what, what we've also discovered in this time of crisis is that you can overscript everything, right? And when you do overscript it, it becomes less believable to your audience. And so what we've decided is we're going scriptless. We may have a few bullet points that we want to make, but it's forcing us to be more authentic because we'll, we'll stumble. We won't be perfect. And, and with that becomes, hey, this is actually being spoken from the heart. So I think that 
we as we oftentimes our comps teams are great, but they may just make it it's too polished and it doesn't come off as authentic. So, or as authentic as we'd like it to. So I, I say, you know what, let's go a little bit more like this. This is a great environment for us. These are the type of things that I think people would, they value because it's more honest. It feels more honest. They can trust it a little bit more. Every, every huddle has its, its primary quote and there it is. We're going scriptless. We're going scriptless. There it is. <laughs> Appreciate that, Michael. Yeah, now, be, we're going to a question. Yeah, Bruce Deneker, you have a great question. You want to go ahead and ask that to Michael? Yes, um, hopefully you can hear me. Yep. We can, thank you. Okay. Hey, thank you. Thank you, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning and thank you, Michael, for taking all these questions. Certainly the leadership here at Alcon has been very good. I, I can tell you from uh, all levels up and down, we've heard and been told everything we need to know and, and we're thankful for that. My question though is, is simply this, I think we have found in, and I believe it was you know, Craig, who mentioned we do work an extra three hours a day, and, and it's so convenient to run in and out of the office. I love it. I think it's a good thing to be able to do that. We stay more in touch and certainly more connected. However, we haven't experienced bringing in new folks yet. And, and as you know, there's always the dynamics in, a, uh, in, a, in an office that are invaluable with regard to the training that we give people and the, uh, the insights that we give people just by, by meeting face to face and saying, oh, by the way, when you, when you go and um, you, you approach this person this way or you, you present this that way, those things are gonna be lost now. And so as we integrate and say, well, there might be more remote work in the future, how is it that you see us really integrating a new person to Alcon uh, in this day and age? Yeah, well, Bruce, I, I, frankly, I haven't thought about it, to be honest. And, uh, and we are going to be hiring a number of people as we go through these, you know, the upcoming quarters. So this is going to be an, an important question for us to ask. I think onboarding and to help people understand the culture and the tone of the organization is incredibly important. I think it helps shape the way that we behave and our social norms. So we need to figure that out. I don't have a, a very clear answer for you right now. It's something that I think us as an executive team are gonna need to, to really think about. Um, I, you know, we started the onboarding process uh, a couple of years ago, which I think was really needed. We were having trouble with early attrition of new associates. And it's because we couldn't shape the, that relationship with the new associates. So they really understood the purpose of the company and what we were doing. Um, as we do this virtually, I think it's going to be really important for us as leaders to stay engaged in that first onboarding experience so that people can hear from us at the top of the organization. I know many of the, my colleagues and the folks who report to me go into our Best Start program and they're a part of that Best Start program. Um, we need to continue to do that. And if we have to do it virtually, then we should really be paying attention to it. I see a couple of my HR colleagues on the phone right now. So um, we may want to take this as an action item, something that we really think of. And, and Misty's sitting there giving me a thumbs up. So uh, yeah, so she's working on it already. Uh, Bruce, really appreciate the question. Something for us to thoughtfully work through. So I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep throwing feedback out here. As collaborative leaders, Michael's walking the talk right now. I mean, how refreshing is it to hear a leader in his position, president, global business and innovation, to say, great question, I haven't thought about that yet. That's, that to me is powerful. And, and aligned teams are led by collaborative leaders. And so he's making Bruce the hero uh, authentically, sincerely. Uh, Michael, you're walking the talk. You're showing us what it looks like to do it right now in action. Appreciate that. Bruce, give yourself a raise, man. That, that's just, that's <laughs> impressive, setting that up. I give you the thumbs up, Bruce. Nice job. Yeah. Now the HR folks are, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've got a process for that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Kyle, right, let's come back to some more questions. Yeah, I'm going to merge a couple. Um, since Misty just had a shout out, I'm going to go to Johnny Cisneros because they have a very similar question. So, Johnny, if you want to unmute yourself ask your question about the new normal, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, good morning. Um, so Michael, uh, I, you know, like everybody, we've been working from home in the past uh, four or five weeks. 
And uh, I'm really curious from your perspective as an executive of our organization, what is that learning that you would like to see going forward that you find uh, useful uh, to be successful and productive and effective? What is that learning that you would like to see going forward in whatever the new normal looks uh, w that we will have uh, in the future? Yeah, it, you know, it's a great question. It's, I'll tell you, the, the thing that has happened to me is it's given me a lot of time to be reflective. You know, in an office environment, in our normal working environment, I'm running from meeting to meeting and I don't have enough time to actually reflect on what's happened to us. And so I, I think for me, it is taking the time to now plan more. Um, it, it's a really interesting thing. I think we're going to see a lot more um, speed in what we do because we're spending more time planning and we're not jumping to execution as quickly. And so for me, the takeaway for me is planning is going to be key. And then the execution can flow more naturally from that. And so I'm going to spend a lot more time being reflective. I'm going to spend a lot more time with the teams incubating ideas and plans. And then I'm going to think about driving to the execution, maybe a little bit later. Um, it, I don't think it'll slow us down. I think it'll help us solve problems up front, allow us to think through the issues, and then when we get to execution, everybody will be aligned. They'll know what their role is. They'll understand the imperative. They'll understand what barriers we have to overcome, and then they can go snap right into action. And that's something that, um, that I've kind of learned over the last four or five weeks. The, the other thing that I, I'll tell you I did, um, I, I was, because I was home, I could clean out all the drawers of all the stuff that I've transferred from life to, you know, and, and I've decided that I'm only going to keep one thing from each period of my life that's important to me. And I also went back and I pulled out all the 360s that people have done for me over the course of my career, and I read them. And you know what? There are certain things I have not changed out of all those 360s, and I either need to change them or I just need to say I'm never going to change them. But the reality is, is there's, there, this is a really good time to go back and look at what you, people have said that you need to do better um, in order for you to, to grow with the organization. And so I found it a little bit, um, as a matter of fact, I stacked them. I stacked them under my computer here, right? They're right here. So uh, I think it's a time to think about, you know, how you can get better, and how you can help the organization get better. Right now is is probably the second thing that I would tell you is probably worth taking the time to do right now. Let's drill down, drill down that, Johnny. Thanks for that question. Let's go one step further, Michael. Ah, uh, mistakes, oh, let's call them lessons learned when it comes to aligning teams cross-functionally. Uh, anything that yeah. sticks out for you that the rest of us could benefit from in your wisdom and lessons learned? Yeah, Craig, you're, you know, that's brutal, right? I don't make mistakes. I mean, come on, no. The, the, look, I will tell you that uh, I've, made, I've made multiple mistakes, right? I've led large teams. I've, uh, I've transferred myself into problems. I, I'm one of those guys where if there's a fire, I would rather be running to the fire than running away from the fire. I like complex, challenging situations. It, it intellectually stimulates me. But you go into those situations and there's a really good chance that you're gonna, you're gonna have a foot fault. You're gonna enter the situation improperly or you're gonna try to do it a little too aggressively. Um, I would say that it happened to me when I first got to Alcon, the culture, it's understanding the culture of the organization and some of the scars that existed in the organization. You really should understand what are the things that have happened in the history that shaped the problem that you're, you're trying to go solve. And, you know, as we started into some of this change management and this cultural change that we were trying to insert, I probably went a little too quickly on, um, we had a program that wasn't as successful as we all thought it could be. I wanted to do what I call the black box deep dive, which is the plane crashed. The only thing that's left is the flight recorder, the black box. Let's go in and let's look at what went wrong 
I positioned that incorrectly. What we should have gone in is we should have said, look, the program was successful. We can learn from this program so that the next program is better um, and, and be more, it was okay to fail forward, right? And, and so a collaborative leadership is all about building trust and confidence and that interpersonal relationship between you as a leader and the rest of the organization. And then the other thing that I would say is when you're in a leadership role, what you say and how you say it matters. People take things very seriously and very personally when it comes from a leader in the organization. I think you, you just need to be very conscious of how you say things and what you're saying to the organization. So, and I've made plenty of mistakes. Man, thank yeah. you for that. That might be one of my biggest insights from our huddle today, that, that just pausing and instead of rushing in, which sends a signal that you can't handle this. Um, you need yeah. me to save the day versus the collaborative leadership approach of being quite aware of what it means to move into buyers, crises, and so forth. Thank you for that. Kyle, other questions from our network? Yes, and I'm gonna. I want to build on that because I think it's really. Um, you just triggered something for me, Michael. Um, while I'm asking this question, Douglas Reeves, I'm gonna come to you here in a sec. So be ready for that. Um, over Michael's shoulder, you have a, a football, and it, it triggered something in my mind that you know we're either on offense or we're on defense, or you're in the stands and you're not in the game. And I think right now, when we have all this going on, when fear comes in, people tend to go on defense, right? It's your prevent defense. And we all sit there and we go, you're going to lose the game. Stop doing that, right? Like do what you were doing in the beginning when you were winning. But how do you establish a culture of that, hey, guys, this is uncharted territory. We're still going to be on the offense because we're going forward. Because you just mentioned that. You said, how do we fail forward? How do you let people know, you're, you're people that are, uh, that are answering to you, your direct reports, that it's okay, that we're going to make mistakes. Because I think sometimes intellectually you, you hear that, but people go, but I don't believe you. Right, because if I do this and if I get caught or if I fail this way, then what does that mean to me? And, and as human beings, it's always about right, like survival, protection, whatnot. So how do you how do you do that? How do you allow people to be on the offense without fear of reprisal? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a really good question. Look, it, it's how you react to the situation as a leader, right? Do you react like, oh my God, I can't believe you guys have failed, or do you react by saying? wow, this is a new opportunity for us to grow as an organization, right? And it's, what did we do in the process that, that was an element that was within our control that we should learn from? And that is, you know, and, and so you said offense and defense. I, I, I'm thinking special teams here, right? I mean, we've got an opportunity when that happens to to really put together a special team to take a look at it and say, okay, that's, we, we know we can do better than this. Nobody ever goes in intentionally trying to fail. And so if you, if you can sit with them and, and help them see kind of the gaps or what they could have done differently. And that what I will tell you is one of the reasons why most teams fail is that they don't listen to diverse opinion. They don't bring in the other functions to pressure test the idea, right? So when, when we're trying to do at Alcon is we're trying to bring our teams together and make sure that everybody has a very strong voice at the table. Uh, one of my leaders is doing something now in every meeting where they're taking a functional specialist and they're giving them the role of being a challenger. Your job in this meeting is to challenge the organizational thinking, to challenge the, you know, how we're making, uh, having the conversation, are we asking enough right questions? And what that's really doing is it's spreading the responsibility across all the functions to take action and to have a voice, right? How many times do you sit in a meeting where one of the smartest people at the table never says anything. If you're not asking them for, you know, what is the insight that you're taking from this discussion? Or if you're not spent, you know, you should be calling out these people and because they don't have, may not have the confidence to just jump in. And so I think it's, it's important as a leader to make sure that you've got the diverse voice and, and that'll help people 
And you'll fail a lot less if you bring really smart people into the conversation. I love it. Okay. That's a perfect answer. Of course, I, I framed it with offense and defense, and then you found a way to get special teams in there. That was brilliant. <laughs> hey. Uh, Douglas, I'm going to come to you. Uh, your question, Douglas Reeves, do you want to answer or ask that real quick? You're on mute. You're on mute. There we go. Uh, there is we that go. better? Uh, yep. First of all, I, I just want to really reinforce what you said about diverse point of views. Uh, it's really hard when everybody is afraid of disagreement. So sometimes you actually have to assign people to present different decision alternatives so that you can consider advantages and disadvantages of each. So thanks for doing that. My question had to do with availability fatigue. You know, everybody's trying to be a hero during these weeks, maybe months. And the problem is I'm seeing the timestamps on my colleagues' emails from five in the morning till midnight. And ultimately, heroism um, and and burnout are not sustainable strategies. What are you doing to, to control burnout and availability fatigue? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. Yeah, we started to have kind of social hours at um, the end of the day, really just to define that the day is over, right? And we, and we plant these things, it, they're either happening once or twice a week. And it really, it's a signal to the organization, it's okay to stop. Let's all have a cocktail together. Or let's all have a huddle at the end of the day. But that's to signal to the organization that we're done. Then the second thing that I've done as a leader, we now have uh, the way our network is set up. If I work online, the emails automatically go out. What I'm doing is I'm turning off all of my network connections. Because if I'm as the leader sending out an email on a, on a, at 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at night, People have a sense that they have to respond to these things. Same thing on the weekend. So I'm, I'm just shutting off my network connection so that, that I'm signaling to the organization it's okay. Um, now, look, people have to make that choice themselves, but I think we as leaders need to tell them it's okay to make that choice as well. I and mean, we all now that our offices are our homes, it's really simple to slip in, knock out a couple more emails or, or try to solve a problem. We just have to communicate it's all right. And they may not respond that way, but we've got to send the right signals. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Douglas. Yeah, Doug, I actually come back to you uh, in the space that you play in creativity and, 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 and uh, outcomes and, and student achievement and beyond. Uh, what else would you add to Michael's words? Uh, you influence a lot of people around the world. I know your work well, it's brilliant. What might you add in response to that? What do you see it that's working well out there? Well, I, I've heard so many great ideas uh, from Michael and from all of your colleagues uh, this morning. Uh, I, I do want to really emphasize the idea of, of people want to please the boss and part of ple pleasing the boss sometimes is, is covering up disagreement. When I think our decision-making disciplines are much better served by giving our, our boss uh, different alternatives. And that doesn't mean that they're winners or losers, but when there's alternatives, some will be chosen, others won't. There's as much value in presenting our boss an alternative that is not selected as presenting one that is selected. That's not a loser. That's just giving the boss better information yeah. uh, to, to make decisions. And I think if we're striving for innovation and creativity, as Craig said, um, the heart and soul from international studies that I've done, the heart and soul of innovation and creativity is trial and error. So you got to have a culture of trial and error where errors are not only forgiven, but errors are celebrated because that's what leads to the ultimate success. Thank yeah. you for that. You Thank know, you Douglas, that. one of the big watch outs for me as a leader is that I'm fairly charismatic. And so I have to be careful that I don't step into a conversation too early because when I say something, I can influence the, the, the decision very quickly. And that's, that's something that I've erred on before as well. So you need exactly what you're saying. As a leader, you need to hear this kind of tangential thinking and you need to ask for it. Otherwise, you're going to wind up making some really poor decisions. And, you know, I, I have to caution myself regularly that it's not my turn to speak. It's my turn to listen and ask questions um, and, and time my input uh, just so I can so I don't wind up making a bad decision for the organization just by my influence. So. Smart, smart. Uh, and and. 
painful. This is always the fastest 50 minutes uh, in the history of humankind. These huddles go so quick. Uh, we're going to be coming back and wrapping things up uh, and hearing our insights in an instant, which we like to call them, uh, from Kyle. I'll share one as well, and then we'll wrap up with Michael. Uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping items, important ones, uh, like so many of the organizations in the collaborative leadership network that are in this time of crisis and this time of uncertainty and volatility are actually serving communities. We're going to join that. I'm excited to share that these huddles have inspired some, some really important work with several of our clients around the world. And so we're offering, uh, we want to do, we want to uh, provide three, we're going to start with three pro bono gifts in these Align 360 huddles, if you will. You can see in the screen some of those things that we'd be accomplishing in 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, the wickedly talented Kyle Shelley, who continues to elevate the bar for us and delivering on our mission and our purpose within the market, is going to be facilitating those. And so you can see his email address there at the bottom. If you're interested in knowing more about the Align 360 huddle, you'd like to replicate these types of discussions, uh, accelerate the, the delivery of your imperative within your organization, please reach out to Kyle for more information or to be considered. Also additional resources, of course, for you as always. Uh, the Do Big Things book has, has been incredibly uh, popular and effective in equipping leaders to have these types of collaborative leadership discussions. The Connected Focus video cast comes out every other week, uh, opposite of the collaborative leaders huddle. And so thank you for your response to the thousands of you that have been uh, watching those with your teams, using them to facilitate discussions. I love your questions that you're sending and the feedback is valuable for me personally and for Veris Global, and of course, uh, join us on LinkedIn. There's Elcon, helping the world see brilliantly. Uh, your eye care professional knows about Elcon and can answer the questions that you have there. Uh, and again, uh, as an advocate for their work, uh, that affects my life, thank you so much. Uh, Kyle, let's start with you as we wrap up our time together. Your insight in an instant. What did you gain from our time together in this <laughs> model that's most important to you? You know, um, Michael, thank you, first of all, for, for joining us. Always a, a thought leader and someone that's truly authentic. And I think that was the biggest takeaway for me was a lot of leadership stays up in the clouds and, and they don't put themselves forward. It, it needs to be primmed and it needs to be almost rehearsed and they don't allow it to be organic. So those leaders that are listening, they go, ah, I don't really know exactly what to say. It's this conversation. It's being transparent. It's stepping forward. It's going, hey, I make mistakes too and then giving clarity to where we're going. And you're doing that with having challengers, which is amazing, right? And I think the co-discovery questions to have the co-creation was another big insight that you had. So if you're not manipulating or curving the trajectory of the team because you are influential, you're actually just asking those questions that engage for co-discovery and then they will lead to the ultimate solution, maybe even a better solution, that's great leadership. So I think those are the two massive insights that I pulled from you. Excellent. Uh, my insight in an instant in answering our question, how do you, how do you align teams cross-functionally? Michael, you, you help me get even deeper the importance of just being our natural selves uh, because oftentimes the politics and organizations, it's about positioning ourselves, politicking, if you will, and you're just a breath of fresh air, just the reminder of uh, how effective we can be as collaborative leaders by being our authentic selves. Thank you for that. Michael, thank you for joining us. Your insights, what did you gain from our time together today? Well, look, I, I think that every one of us needs a great coach. And Craig, you and your team have done an incredible job with our organization, right, in helping coach us through some really difficult conversations and, and challenges within our organization. So I thank Varus for being a massive part of the changes that are occurring within our organization. If you're not using Veris, I would tell you, this isn't a commercial for Veris. It works, right? Getting people together, getting them on the same page, aligned, building that trust is really important. And so I, I think being coached as a leader is one of the things that I take away from these type of conversations. The other thing that I would say, in building trust as a leader, you have to go first. You can't wait for the organization to trust you. You need to trust the organization and you need to go first. So I would just tell you as a, as a leader, step into that conversation 
Um, they may not believe you at first, right? I mean, I think when I first got to Alcon, people didn't believe that I really cared about them more than I cared about my success. As they started to see that that was a consistent theme in the way that I behaved, they started to trust me and we started to accelerate as an organization. We were really able to turn this thing around. So I would just say go into every, every engagement believing that the other person has the best intention and trust them first. And then naturally you'll build a solid relationship and that collaboration will start to happen for you. And the results will come very quickly after that. But again, Craig, thank you and Kyle for inviting me into the huddle. Um, you guys do a great job. And I think everybody here appreciates the work that you're doing. Man. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. That's what I'm talking about, Michael. Uh, our next Collaborative Leaders Huddle, you can see the date. We'll have best-selling author Keith Ferrazzi joining us, thought leader. The question is, will be how do you how do you lead when you don't have that authority? Talk about collaborative leadership. That's a that's an essential skill to have. Looking forward to that discussion in two weeks. Uh, and of course, remember everyone, leadership matters, but only teams deliver. Thank you for your collaborative leadership work.